Please be seated. You know, there's nothing more intimidating than preaching on the Sunday when one is supposed to talk about wisdom. <laughs> Other people get scared by the Trinity. No, there are books about that. <laughs> the implication is, if I have something to impart to you about wisdom, then I must be wise. But what I'm going to tell you is that anybody who considers himself wise is not at all wise. <laughs> so let's start with King Solomon. Um, I need to point out to you that you got a little snippet of chapter one and then it conveniently skipped over chapter two and went straight to chapter three, where the lovely, highly respected King Solomon says, I am but a little child, God. I don't know what to do. Give me wisdom. But in chapter two, when King David died and King Solomon needed to solidify his position as the next king, he killed off a bunch of relatives so that they couldn't come after him. Then he enslaved 30,000 citizens to build a house for God. He enslaved them. It's that he actually says he enslaved his own people. Other kings don't do that. Even Pharaoh didn't enslave his own people. But okay, King Solomon is wise. He says something interesting. Although he is clearly a man who has just um, uh, exercised a violent um, takeover and control of his kingdom, he says, I am a little child and I don't know what to do. He recognizes what the Psalm says today, fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. And the, tr the word fear is not the right word. It's a combination of reverence, love, awe, just utter nonstop praise of God. The you are amazing God prayer. That is what fear of God is. And that is the beginning of, the wis beginning of wisdom. And the reason that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom is it's an admission, it is an admission that we ourselves are not wise. And so we turn to God who is the source of wisdom, to Christ who is wisdom. That is why Solomon is granted wisdom by God because he starts by saying, I am not wise. And God says, because that's the only thing you ask for, I'll give you that. And then a fairy tale story, he says, and I'll make you rich and famous as well. Although we know that riches and fame are not the actual source of wisdom in real life. So what is wisdom? It means knowing what is right, knowing what is true, and then doing the right and true things. It has pure ethical pureness and then acting upon it. Wise thoughts, wise actions. It's not the same thing as worldly wisdom. There's a difference between worldly wisdom and the wisdom of God. That's why in Isaiah, God says, your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts, says the Lord. And I don't want to diss, totally diss worldly wisdom. There are advantages to worldly wisdom, the kind of wisdom that we get by growing up and learning, the kind of wisdom other people impart to us that you get from sayings and adages, such as, don't bite the hand that feeds you. Would everybody pretty much agree that that's a pretty good thing to follow most of the time? But would we also agree that when the hand that feeds you is evil and corrupt, Maybe you need to get away from that, the, right? The hand that's feeding you if it's evil and corrupt or feeding you and then slapping you or something like that. That's the distinction between worldly wisdom and the wisdom of God. Worldly wisdom can be acquired through experience or telling others. The wisdom that comes from God is a little bit different and it is often achieved or found because we realize we don't have it. So the interesting thing about godly wisdom is that we should desire it as Solomon desired it. So we desire it. We should seek to acquire it, but we not, should not seek to be admired for it. How many of you, when you needed wisdom and advice in your life, would go to somebody who put out a plaque every day that said, come to my office dispensing wisdom all day? You wouldn't. You wouldn't expect that to be the source of wisdom. 
The interesting thing about wisdom is that it is not a permanent state that there are wise people and foolish people and never the twain shall meet. It is a moment, a glimpse, when we need it and it comes upon us when we have sought after it. You've probably seen this as a common cartoon um, or comic strip where there's like a guru sitting on a high mountaintop in the Himalayas and somebody hikes up the mountain and they say, grant me wisdom, but I don't want to wait very long and it can't hurt. <laughs> See, everybody, yes. There are ways to acquire it. And we are very lucky in that in the scriptures we have this fountain of wisdom. In fact, there are five books in the Bible that are called the books of wisdom, if you don't know where to start. One of them is the book of Job. I don't quite, that's not quite the source for me, but okay. The book of Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, um, Ecclesiasticus, what am I forgetting? Uh, which is the, oh, and the book of wisdom. Ecclesiasticus is also known as the book of Sirach, and your Bible might say the book of Sirach. And then the book of wisdom, or the book of wisdom of Solomon. Just in the book of Proverbs alone, you could find enough food to fuel your whole life. I didn't discover it until I was in my, maybe my mid-30s, and I started attending an Episcopal church and took a Bible study course. And I discovered the book of Proverbs, and I thought, why didn't anybody give this to me when I was 16? It would have saved me so much trouble at work, at home, in relationships. I'm just gonna give you an example random page from the book of Proverbs about a whole, whole bunch of things. An ally offended is stronger than a city. Such quarreling is like the bars of a castle. Uh, one who is slack in work is close kin to a vandal. Before destruction, one's heart is haughty, but humility goes before honor. If one gives answer before hearing, it is folly and shame. <laughs> My first job out of school, had I known that, would have gone so much better. <laughs> so, scriptures. Scriptures are a tremendous source of wisdom. I also want to say that if you want to have like a practice, well, what other practice besides praying for wisdom and reading about it in the Bible, what would be another practice I could have? I would recommend silence and waiting when you don't know what to do. And I tell you the story from my previous church. We had had a long-standing agreement with AT&T. They built a server house on our parking lot. It was about as big as our chapel. And it just contained servers, and they'd put in cooling, you know, cooling, like air conditioning to cool the servers. And they paid us about $33,000 a year in rent, which we needed to cover some of our expenses. They announced that they were going to leave, and they said, we'll give you a year's rent so you can recover this income in another way. And at the end of that year, we can either raise the building, get rid of it, or you, you, you can keep the building. You decide. So our buildings and grounds people checked it out, and they said, it's actually a quite well-built building. And then all the proposals started flying. Guy on the finance committee knew a guy who was an architect, and he drew a blueprint for how we could make two small student apartments just across the street from a major university and, and rent them inexpensively. Um, but there was a whole working group on our campus that was working on the idea of getting a grant from Trinity Wall Street and from developers to build uh, kind of a higher structure, take over our whole parking lot, put the church parking lot underneath, and give housing to more like 80 students. So I wasn't interested in the two-student solution. I was interested in getting rid of it so that we could get closer to the building housing for lots more people. Uh, the 88-year-old person who had started the thrift shop 30 years before, after it got canceled, she was mad it got canceled, so she wanted to bring back the thrift shop. Other people wanted to turn it into a youth room, even though we already had a youth room. Other people wanted it to be a rehearsal hall for local musical groups. So I said, we're going to have a vestry meeting where we'll have like a brainstorming and we'll listen to all the ideas. So I walked into that Zoom room at my dining table, thinking, I'll listen to the others and then I'm going to advocate for getting rid of the building and I'm sure they're gonna see the wisdom of that move. <laughs> so I said, I'll wait, I will listen. 
So I listened, idea number one, idea number two, idea number three. We had wi six wildly different ideas and three other vestry members going, I don't know. And then I had my idea, but nobody, and lots of people said we shouldn't get rid of it, it's such a great building. So I thought, okay, I don't think my idea is very good, so I'm not gonna say anything now, even though I was quite sure when the meeting started that it was the best idea and everybody would agree with me. So we said, we're gonna have to wait because we clearly don't have any consensus. Let's just pray about this and see what's, what we're doing. Months later, um, one of, another church that had been renting, it was like a parachurch, it was sort of like Baptists who wanted to uh, uh, work with students on campus. They would have daily prayer meetings in our, in our parish hall and bring on uh, recent graduates of UCSD who would pray, study the Bible, and then go over there and proselytize to students on the campus. And they were paying us money to do that. And they announced that they had found their own building and they were leaving. Everybody was panicked and I said, don't worry, God will do something. So I go home that night and I said one prayer, not, no anxiety, just I said one prayer, God, it'd be nice to have another church. And the next morning, my parish, parish administrator says, there's a man who's the executive pastor of a church down in Point Loma and they're spreading, they want a satellite church near La Jolla, and they want to talk to us about renting our church. And I said, oh, on what day? Like, when would they have their services? And she said, Sunday. And I said, Sunday's impossible. We already got two churches in here on Sundays, impossible. She goes, well, they just want to come and look. I said, okay, fine, they can come and look. So they came and they looked, and they were looking at the parish hall, not our sanctuary, but another, a very large parish hall, about four times the size of what we have. Um, and she said, the executive pastor wants to meet with you. So I walk in like, okay, fine, I'll walk through the, I'll walk through the parish. Yes, look at our lovely windows. Yes, it is large. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, yes. And then he says, well, what about our having services here on Sunday? And I said, I just don't see how, because first we're there, we have two services, then the Catholics come and it's our cars leaving, their cars coming in, multiple events going on in the parish hall between their church and ours. And he says, well, we would come in early to set up and we'd have our service in between your two services and we'd be out of the parking lot before you need us. And I'm starting to think, I don't know, maybe it is possible. And he said, can we cover, we had like two story high glass windows looking out on pine trees. And he goes, can we cover those with black paper? I said, no, you cannot cover <laughs> them with black paper. Can we hang speakers? No, you can't hang speakers because the walls wouldn't sustain it. And he goes, okay, well, we can work this out. So I finally say, maybe it's possible. And he goes, what we're really interested in is that little building over there. Could we turn that into office space? I said, sure, if you paid for all the construction work and did it to code. And he goes, done. And we'll pay you this much money per year. All we had to do was wait. Now, I'm sure at some point I said to God, God, what should we do with that building? And I didn't get an answer. So when you don't get an answer, I'm gonna make this easier for Michael. Hi, Michael. If you don't get an answer, you wait. Now, you could also gather from my story about consulting with the vestry is that the other place where discernment happens well to get help with discernment is in a group of people. And often the group of people will slowly through discussion and prayer, if they're praying intently, arrive at the answer together, and it will all of a sudden become clear to them. The other thing that can happen also is that sometimes there's a lone voice in a group, the lone member of the family who thinks it's a bad idea to go on vacation in Hawaii, the lone member who thinks we should do this with our product line, the lone member who thinks we should hold on to the building and rent it to another church or something. There's often a lone voice, and so the only practice I can think of, practical practice, besides praying and studying, is when you don't know, wait. Remember Elijah, our poor guy from last week? Elijah kept listening for the voice of God and wasn't finding it and was losing faith in his ability to perceive the voice of God until he went into a quiet cave. And after he had waited, God showed up in the silence. So that is so often when God imparts those little moments of wisdom to us. Amen.